This is the title of my presentation, Traditional Indian Iron and Steel Making, Retrospect and Prospects. Next slide, please. So this is going to be the structure of the presentation. Start with describing the landmark publication of Dharampalji of 1971. Give a bird's eye view of what was a pre-British Indian situation. Give an overview about efforts during the current period and conclude with what I think are the current relevance and potential of this area. Next slide, please. So this is the publication that Dharampalji brought out in 1971. It's sized in my memory with this kind of a color and the cover. Next one. Next slide, yeah. So what does this book talk about? It compiled several articles by British officers, scholars, and observers about Indian sciences in areas like astronomy, mathematics, and technological practices in medicine, metallurgy, agriculture, architecture, and so on. The book created a new appreciation of the sophistication and efficacy of Indian sciences and technologies before the coming of the British. Next slide. Now, three of the articles in the technology section of the book are about iron metallurgy as observed in different parts of India. They provided an indication of the spread, the quantities, the qualities, and the value of Indian iron and steel in the international market. Next one. So, there are two aspects to what this communicates to us about the Indian situation on the eve of British conquest. One is certain physical facts relating to the science and technology aspects and certain equally important things relating to what I call as the attitudes of the European scholars and the bias that is underlying that. Next one. What are some of the basic physical facts? These may be considered as commonplace that something that every Indian schoolboy or scientist should know. But so poorly educated we are about the history of our own sciences and technologies that this was quite a bit of a revelation at the time when Dharampalji's book was published. Some of the basic facts that I am trying to recall are even as late as the 18th century, iron was being smelted in tens of thousands of locations in a cottage scale operation, smelting furnaces spread all over India. Steel was being made by two different processes. One is the carburization of wrought iron, which is a more widespread process. <clears throat> but there was also the presence of the other kind of process, decarburization of cast iron that was observed in some parts of India. Steel was manufactured in large quantities and it was being exported to Europe and the Middle East. A lot of the export initially went to Europe through the Middle East. Next one. Now, what happened to this process? The traditional process of iron and steel making suffered a decline after the 18th century and there were various reasons. And some of the reasons that we could find out were extensive deforestation because it depended quite a bit on the use of wood and forest produce, levy of repressive taxes and the colonial rule, and the loss of control of the local community over the forest resources. Now, through the 19th century and down to the turn of the 20th century, various attempts to reproduce the superior Indian steel and to discover what was called as its secrets had been made and were continuously made in England, France and Russia since the 18th century. And these efforts continued in Russia till the turn of the century, 20th century. For example, it was even considered by some that perhaps the source of the special properties of the steel was that the source of carbon itself is special and people even try to do a carbonization of rotten iron using diamond as a source of carbon. Now traditional Indian iron and steel making and studies on it receded into the background during the end of the 19th century. 
Now, there's something equally important apart from the physical facts relating to science and technology and metallurgy that comes across in Dharampalji's books, which I think is equally important. For example, we learned from one of his papers that Helena Scott sent a communication to the Royal Society in 1794. He sent them a sample of woods and in the forwarding letter, he said, that it appears to admit of a harder temper than anything we are acquainted with, by means by which he means it's superior to anything that's known in England or Europe. However, when this communication was published by the Royal Society in Philosophical Transactions, the article subtly changed the wording of the letter. And then it says, it admits of a harder temper than anything known in that part of India. Now, this is a kind of bias towards Indian knowledge that systematically comes across in the European reports and accounts. But this is something that's important for us to know because today this kind of bias may not be so obvious in the writings from the West since the discourse has become much more sophisticated. But we'll be naive if we are thinking that this kind of bias is completely absent. This is something which we need to constantly bear in mind when we are drawing conclusions that are drawn completely or exclusively from European or non-Indian sources. Next slide, please. Now, what are the efforts during the recent periods? Now, inspired and guided by the works of Sri Dharampal, efforts were made starting from the mid-1980s onwards, initially by the PPST Foundation and later by Centre for Indian Knowledge Systems. I want to share a few highlights before. I mean, in the following section, one aspect of these efforts was a comprehensive documentation from the literature and the archives. What did they say? And then equally importantly, efforts were made to reconstruct and characterize the traditional Indian process for iron and steel making, iron making at least, iron smelting in a few locations by various organizations. Next slide. Some of the highlights in terms of what the documentation showed was that exists even now by means of which, I mean, when I say now, I'm talking about 1980s, 1990s, the year 2000 and around during the turn of the 20th century, 21st century, a large number of artifacts of high quality products of Indian metallurgy, such as the iron pillar in Delhi. I think it's too well known for me to be describing it as what's called as a rust proof pillar. But what is not so well known is there are also equally important and impressive iron pillar at Dhar in Madhya Pradesh. There is iron pillars in Kodachadri Hills in Karnataka, besides various huge iron structure and cannons. Now, the importance of this is derived from the fact that if you look at the iron pillar in Delhi, Delhi has a very low humidity. It has a dry and desert-like climate. That a piece of huge iron there resist corrosion for a long time is relatively less impressive than the fact that if you come to a place like Kodachadri Hills in Karnataka, where there is exposed rain for several months of the year and a high degree of humidity, even there, there are structures like this, which are relatively resistant to corrosion. In the area of non-ferrous metallurgy, there has been a long tradition of work with copper, silver, gold, tin, brass, zinc, and bronze. For example, there's extensive documentation to show that zinc in a few form was perhaps produced in the Zawar region of Rajasthan as early as 150 BC, even during that period when these studies were going on in 1980s, 1990s. There were famous Indian archaeometallurgists like Professor KTM Hegde of MS University, Baroda, who has been involved in studying the traditional Indian process for zinc making in Zawar and other regions. Next slide, please. There are also important living traditions of what I call as metal working, such as casting of icons as brass, bronze, and panchaloha, making of steel wires and casting of metallic mirrors. For example, if you look at steel wires that I use wires that I use the strings and musical instrument for a long time till very recent time in the West, people are using guts of animals, whereas there is reason to believe that steel wire has been used 
high quality steel wires with high tonal quality has been used as strings in the vena for several centuries before today chennapatna is one of the areas where the steel wires were made and even as late as 1990s when the study was carried out people could identify descendants of some of the people who used to make steel wires in chennapatna a few decades back it is also seen that there is a large body of literature on rasa shastra in sanskrit and other languages some of it goes into the technical detail of metallurgy and metal working next slide <clears throat> now to address this question of what do we think is the current relevance and potential of this is all this meaningful or important as history yes of course it's important and meaningful as history but does it have any more or a wider meaning than that if you ask the question what is its current relevance and potential the answer may be grouped broadly into two categories one dealing with technologies products and processes and another dealing with attitudes perceptions and what it means to build on our strengths next slide for example the tradi study of traditional metallurgy opens up certain possibilities the possibility of setting up decentralized cottage scale iron smelting industries moving towards a more fuel efficient process and exploring the production of iron and steel with special properties each one of these perhaps needs a detailed presentation to dwell on and any significant uh, <coughs> great detail but i just hit the highlights because this is just a general presentation next slide the current modern iron and steel industry is located only in specific pockets of india where we can find iron ore suited to the modern technology and the fuel required for it but what's very interesting is that traditionally iron was smelted and steel was produced in a decentralized manner in thousands of locations all over india hence there is a gross mismatch between the availability of resources and the large scale technologies that we adopted this can be corrected by updating the traditional technology to harmonize with the current day requirements this is means undertaking serious work of a particular kind which we have not done next slide the modern iron and steel plants require as fuel and reducing agent what we call as coking coals now these are fossil fuels and they can be reproduced or replaced only over geological time scales if you are mining coking coals replace this you really need to work over geological time scales the traditional iron and steel plants require as fuel and reducing agent charcoal these are biofuels that can be reproduced or replaced over biological time scales in fact preliminary studies have been carried out to calculate the area of land that has to be cultivated with wood to meet the requirement of traditional iron smelting furnaces in fact one of the persons who has been involved in such calculation studies i am happy to say is professor balal who was part of this meeting and i believe he is still here this can lead to evolving a technology that is significantly more eco friendly than the modern process next slide third aspect is exploring the production of iron and steel with special properties now production of alloys that has certain special properties such as corrosion resistance may be seriously explored it is known that traditional iron and steel have corrosion properties which are superior to modern steel for example in 1963 the national metallurgical laboratory held an international symposium on the delhi pillar one of the papers that were presented shared a very interesting study what the authors did was they compared from the point of view of corrosion the resistance of the delhi iron pillar corrosion resistance of the steel produced by the modern process and the iron that is being produced at that time around 1963 by the tribals using the traditional technology next slide interestingly enough the study concluded that the tribal iron that was produced in 1963 was superior to blast furnace iron from the point of view of corrosion resistance it wasn't the same grade as the delhi pillar iron but it was kind of positioned midway between the blast furnace iron and the delhi pillar iron 
closer to the daily pillar and from the point of view of corrosion resistance. Now, this should be considered as quite remarkable and a study worth pursuing just on these grounds because it's been estimated that the national losses due to corrosion is of the order of tens of thousands of crores of rupees every year. This is something which we are not even scratch the surface of. Next slide. The second aspect that I had mentioned is attitudes, perceptions, and building on our strengths. Is it possible to evolve a technology starting from the traditional process that makes optimum use of our own resources, not only of the ores and fuels, but also the knowledge of our artisans? Now, there is a stupendous number and spread of these artisans, the Vishwakarmas as they are called, who are working with metals throughout the country who are even today playing an important role in the area of material science. Next slide. Some of the outstanding specimens of metals, stones, sculpture and architecture through the ages and right down to this century are products of this community. However, it's a tragedy of our times that our technical institutions and education, training and research relating to material science has developed in a way that offers no particular privilege or place or ways to involve or encourage the participation of this community in this effort, the traditional metal workers. Next slide. I'd like to go back to about a century to quote something very interesting. The Indian Industrial Commission of 1916 held a series of hearings. There was a very moving and prophetic testimony rendered by the secretary of the Vishwakarma Mahajan Conference Committee and who stated, who made the following statement, which is very poignant and I'd like to read this out. The industrial backbone of the country, they were not going to be the beneficiaries of the new policy regarding technical schools. He observed that most of the manual workers were not educated and lacking exclusive literary training were ineligible for technical scholarships. Citing the 1911 census report on the complete disassociation with the intellectual class in the country from its industries, he remarked, the mistake lay in the very first steps taken. That is, the selection of students to go to foreign countries for training from communities other than the industrial or artisan classes who possess the initial aptitude for manual labor, which is a university, gra which a university graduate or any other class despise as a derogation of his caste dignity or literary merits. Sadly, it appears that this divide continues even today, by which I mean people who are in the forefront of research, production, manufacture, metallurgy, metalworking. The modern institutions that train and nurture them have developed their research, their programs, their education, even the selection of candidates in such a way that the huge community of traditional artisans who for millennia have been carriers of this knowledge and tradition are completely left out of this unless by accident they acquire these kind of literary skills. Next slide. Now looking <clears throat> back and looking forward, I'm just coming to the last two statements. Is there any reason to look at traditional Indian metallurgy and metalworking today? I'd say there are three things. One is an understanding of the techniques and processes can help us to build a metallurgical science and technology that makes optimum use of the locally available resources. As I said, today there is a mismatch between the mega science and technology institutions that we have and the resources. It can ensure that the community of metal workers and artisans who have been the custodians and carriers of this knowledge and techniques for millennia can again play a central role in this effort. Next slide, please. And lastly, I'd like to get back to the statement, this very moving statement from Sri Jayaprakash Narayan. In 1971, when Dharampalji published the book Civil Disobedience in Indian Tradition, Sri Jayaprakash Narayan said in a very interesting foreword, the ancients held that the highest form of knowledge is self-knowledge and that he who achieves that knowledge achieves all. It seems to me that the value of self-knowledge holds good for nations as well. So finally, I would sum it up based on this 
it can give us an awareness of who we are and what we can do free of any colonial bias building on tradition